The Mumia exception is so powerful for this one person that not even the Supreme Court will stand up to its force. Mumia got his first federal habeas corpus appeal in 2001 in front of a district court judge named uh, Yon. At the center of Mumia's habeas claim was that the prosecutor at his trial purged otherwise qualified black jurors from sitting on his jury, so he didn't have a jury of his peers. The prosecutor had used, I think it was 11, but let's say it was 10. He used 10 preemptory challenges where you don't have to give any reason why you toss somebody off of a jury. He used 10 of those, he had 15, he used 10 to eliminate blacks. So M Mumia raised this, what's called a Batson claim, a 1986 Supreme Court ruling, United States Supreme Court ruling that says if a prosecutor discriminates in the jury selection uh, on a minority d defendant, Mumia's black, so you can't, if you remove black defendants that would be a violation of Batson, you get a new trial. Well, there was a study done by a professor named Baldus out of Indiana University that studied this particular prosecutor that Mumia had, Joe McGill. He took six trials. One of them was Mumia's. And he demonstrated that this prosecutor had a very high use of peremptory strikes to exclude blacks on, from trials of black defendants. And these are capital trials, trials where people are on, on trial for their life. So this study uh, demonstrated this. Unmistakably, this guy was skewering the system by, this prosecutor was skewering the system in the way he used preemptory challenges. It wasn't fair to these black defendants. But Judge John, he didn't either, he either wasn't careful enough. It's hard for me to tell you why he didn't recognize this and grant a Batson claim. But he said this Baldus study was from an in a not appropriate time period. He thought, it, he thought it was too late. He didn't realize that it included trials right around the time of Mumia's, one right before him, Mumia's own trial, and then uh, other trials right in this three, four year window of McGill's practice as assistant DA. So for whatever reason, he turned down uh, this Batson claim erroneously. He made a big mistake. He did certify the claim though. This was the only claim that he certified, and Mumia has had 21 claims or so. He certified this one claim, which means a, an appeals court, a federal appeals court, could now hear this. It could now look at the Batson claim. So it's an indication that the judge wasn't all that comfortable with the decision he made, and he just passed the buck up. He passed it up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. A number of years went by before Mumia ever got his day in court. I think it was 2005 or so, wasn't it? He finally got to that court and, uh, and then they had oral arguments, uh, finally had oral arguments in what, 2007. So a long time went by. Uh, and they had the oral arguments, I think it was May 17, 2007, in front of a three-judge panel in, in Philadelphia at the, federal, at, the federal, uh, at the appeals court building there in Philadelphia. That hearing, which lasted, they gave, they gave each side an hour to present its case. That hearing really impressed me as being the best day that Mumia had ever had in a courtroom. Uh, his, his claims were very well received by the three judges, it appeared to me, and I think most of the people in that room. So a number of months go by, uh, and the court comes out and makes a two-to-one decision denying Mumia's Batson claim. And it was a big shock. And they, they said the reason they denied it was that during that oral, oral argument, they'd ask Mumia's attorney, could he tell them the racial composition of the whole jury pool? At Mumia's trial, 175 people were impaneled, were, were picked to possibly serve on his jury. Now, this was a death penalty case, so they, they did a vetting of this jury. You had to be pro uh, the death penalty to stay in the room. And a lot of blacks walked out right then and there because they weren't pro death penalty. So that would skewer that audience, that, that jury pool, more white right then and there on that death, death vetting thing. 
So all those people left. What's the what's the racial composition of them? The one of the judges asked uh, Mumi's attorney, and he said, I, "I'm sorry, Your Honor, I'm a day late and a dollar short. I don't know that." Well, uh, what what happened was there was a there was a reason why he didn't know that. At Mumil was entitled to post conviction relief act hearing in 1995, which was presided over by his trial judge Albert Sable, common police court judge a very unfair judge at his trial, and now he's going to be very unfair here. Mumia's attorneys, this would be Leonard Weinglass and Rachel Wolkenstein, they presented 30 subpoenas that they wanted. They wanted the governor to testify about opening Mumia's mail, his legal mail, which he did. No sanctions ever went down for that, but they wanted that. And they wanted the election bureau where the, the jury rolls in Philadelphia are taken from the election rolls. You have to have voted to even be to even qualify to serve on a jury at that time. So they petitioned in the subpoena. They petitioned the records of the election bureau in Philadelphia, so they could see who they had, who these 175 people were, and then they could do their ages, race, sex. They could break down the demographics of it. Well, Sable quashed this subpoena. He, he quashed all 30 of the subpoenas. But when he quashed this one, Rachel Wolkenstein, one of the attorneys, she rose in protest. And as she protested this, he called the bailiff up forward, up forward and had her handcuffed and taken out of the room and put in a, in a jail cell. So this very information that the Third Circuit, the Third Appeals Court uh, thought was so important had been denied them in 1995. Mumia's attorney could have stood there and said, here's the rules, there's the answer. This jury pool was, you know, 22% uh, black. But absent that information, the Third Circuit ruled in this two-to-one decision that this was Mumia's fatal flaw, that he didn't know the racial composition. It no, it's no fault of his own. They made it his fault, like this was something his job was. Now here's where the Mumia exception, exception comes in. This same court, the Third Circuit, in 2004, in a case called Vaughn, they had the same kind of thing. A guy asking for a new trial on a Batson claim, and they asked him if he knew the jury, the composition of the jury pool. His attorneys didn't know it, and the court said, you don't need to know it for a Batson claim. Um, his strike rate was 11 out of 12. I admit that's high. Uh, so 2004, Vaughn gets a new, he gets a Batson hearing. Uh, the court grants him one. 2005, a case called Brinson, same stuff. This is like a strike rate of 11 out of 13, also a high rate. Third Circuit gets Brinson a new trial, even though, I mean, it gets him a Batson hearing, even though he doesn't know the racial composition of his jury. So when Mumia comes along in 2007, just two years later, we have these two precedents sitting there right in front that these judges have participated in, establishing. And then they, they say, now all of a sudden, this particular petitioner, just this one, he needs to know the racial composition of the jury even though the strike rate was 10 out of 15, which is 66.6%. The dissenting judge, Judge Ambrose, he said that's a, that makes the 10 out of 15 is so high that it makes a prima facie case for a Batson, which is all you need is a prima facie case. It's so, it's so clear on its face. It's apparent that there was discrimination. Now we go to the U.S. Supreme Court. The year before, the Supreme Court enlarged the Batson 1986 decision in a case called Snyder. In the Snyder decision, the court now said if the, if the plaintiff can show, the petitioner can show bias in terms of one juror, it's grounds for a Batson hearing. He, has Batson, he gets a Batson hearing. So you'd think now with this great enhancement of the Batson decision that this Supreme Court had made, here they're presented with a case that has just reeks of Batson violation, and at the Supreme Court to get to have a grant to have a writ granted, you only need four of the nine justices to vote in your favor, just to have it heard. It's called the rule of four. So they have this so-called liberal block on the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, um, and then there's the so-called conservative block, and then there's this one Judge Kennedy that hangs out in the middle. But everybody thinks they know how these these four liberal, so-called liberals are going to vote and, and how the, okay. 
So getting four votes didn't seem to be that high of a mountain. It looked extremely likely because, A, there are four so-called liberal votes on the Supreme Court. B, the Third Circuit had tampered with a long-established Supreme Court precedent, the Batson precedent, by putting a requirement on it that the petitioner has to know the composition of the jury. Well, the Supreme Court never said you needed to know that, so they invented, they were really doing the Supreme Court's job. They were adding on to it. They were making law, this three-judge panel. So based on that, I thought there was a very high chance that the court would grant this writ. The Mumia exception is so powerful for this one person that not even the Supreme Court will stand up to its force.